this is a critical issue with regards to the shamanic transformation is that people go through these terrible terrible experiences often drug induced by the way with regards to the shaman they usually use psychedelic chemicals of one form or another often mushrooms but, but they've come up with some very strange concoctions like ayahuasca down in the Amazon and ayahuasca is an amazing substance it's made out of the bark of one thing and uh, another plant whose name I don't remember that hardly even grow in the same place and that have to be cooked together in a special way and no one has any idea how the damn Amazonians figured that out it looks impossible and if you ask them they say well the plants told us how to do it which you know western people don't find very helpful but the shamans are perfectly help happy with that that description and ayahuasca takes them apart and it does that in part because it affects the serotonergic system very very powerfully like all psychedelics do and it transports them to another world and that's how they interpret it and 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 what we know about psychedelics you could put in a thimble and then throw the thimble away we know nothing about psychedelics uh, there's new experiments going on at Johns Hopkins for example with psilocybin which is part of this active chemical in magic mushrooms same structure basically as LSD and mescaline and all the real psychedelics have basically the same structure except the one that's derived from Amanita muscaria which is called muscarinic acid and it's a it's its own weird thing that no one knows anything about anyways they have profound neurochemical effects in very small doses and um, the research group at Johns Hopkins has given psilocybin to research subjects you know purified psilocybin because they started the new experimentation with psychedelics and that's been banned for like 40 years because psychedelics were so terrifying to our culture that we just put them away it's like whoa no we're not going there and so even from a research perspective and even though some of the psychedelics look very promising for the treatment of disorders like alcoholism they recently used psilocybin to help people stop smoking down at Johns Hopkins and I think they had an 80 percent success rate which is just like that's just absolutely mind-boggling and so but if you give people psilocybin and they have a mystical experience which is very common among people who take these sorts of chemicals then their personality transforms permanently such that one year later they're one standard deviation higher in openness and openness is the creativity dimension and that seems to be a permanent transformation and so that's really remarkable and about 80 percent of the people who undergo the Johns Hopkins experiments report that the experience is like one of the two or more, three most important things they've ever that, that's ever ever happened to them and so well that's that's something you know it's like and then there's this guy named Rick Strassman down at I think he was at the University of Texas and he did experimentation with DMT and DMT dimethyltryptamine I remember if I remember correctly is the active ingredient in ayahuasca and you produce it in your brain and it's in plants it's like a very common chemical but DMT is a weird hallucinogen because it has an extraordinarily short mechanism of action it's like and people who take it report that they're blasted out of their body like out of a cannon and then they go out somewhere and encounter beings of various sorts and then ten minutes later they're back and virtually everyone reports that which is really strange and, and so Strassman was giving people DMT intravenously so that the trip would last longer he, this was all, all you know, NIH funded uh, experimentation all cleared with the relevant ethics boards all conducted within the last ten years and he basically quit doing it because he was a pretty straight scientist you know he was measuring heart rate and pulse and all that sort of thing trying to look at the physiology and then the people he was giving these chemicals to kept coming back and telling him these these crazy stories and uh, well it just it was too much for him you know and no wonder you know because they all said the same thing and he'd say well that was a dream and they'd say no and it was the most real thing that ever happened to me and he'd say well you know it's an archetypal experience and they'd say no 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 that was no archetypal experience I went somewhere else and I saw things and I'm back and like I don't care what you think and like who the hell knows right because it's all subjective but but the weird thing about it is that everyone's reporting the same thing how the hell do you account for that and then the shaman you know when they take these psychedelic chemicals they basically say the same thing they say well first of all it more or less killed me that's this you know I dissolved to a skeleton and then I climbed the tree that unites heaven and earth and I went into the realm of the gods and they gave me some information and I'm back it's like okay well you know we don't really know what to make of that and we and certainly that's what Eliad describes when he describes the shamanic the shamanic procession not the shamanic initiation and 
you know, there's dissolution to a skeleton first, and then like a death, a symbolic death, or experienced as an actual death, and then bang, up into the realm of the gods, and then they come back. It's a very old idea, I and mean, that's a medieval representation of the tunnel that people travel through at the end of their life to, you know, to find the light, which is a very common near-death experience report, and people don't have any idea what the hell to do with those reports, except say, well, it's the paroxysms of the dying brain, which you'd expect to be a hell of a lot more random, in my opinion. And the idea is there's a rebirth after that. And you know, here, this is the Scandinavian representation of that tree that unites earth with heaven. And so there's the Scandinavian representation. It has a snake, snakes down here eating it. And then, that's the Amazonian representation. It's like, how the hell do you account for that? I mean, those, those pictures are so similar that it's just, it's beyond belief. Well, you know, we lived in trees for a long time. A long, 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 long time. Millions of years. And there were lots of snakes around them. And so the idea that reality is a tree that's surrounded by a snake is, that's in us, man. It's down there. It's deep. And there's something about it that's true. Now, not true like we normally think of truth, but truth, true in an entirely different manner. So, and all that's pretty damn strange. We'll stop with this. My son drew this when he was seven years old. It blew me away, man. I thought it was so cool, so I had it laminated. And so, here is what it is. On the right-hand side, that's order. It's like the yin-yang thing. That's order. Left side, chaos. Right? And those are all mushroom houses, which I thought was amazing. <laughs> and then, there's this river that runs right down the middle, like the line for order and chaos. And then there's this tree that goes up to heaven, and that's heaven up there. It's like, there's St. Peter, there's the pearly gates, there's the clouds. It's like, it's, he never went to church, you know? It's like, what the hell? And then there's a little bug there that goes up and down from heaven to earth. And that was him. And I thought, he had a very organized psyche, that kid. He was a very, very stable kid, and still is. And I, he drew that, and I thought, Jesus, that's just bloody well unbelievable. And I still think that when I look at it. And that's a great example of an archetype. And so, we'll see you Tuesday.